I'm very excited to be talking to Prof. Jan today, who I met several years ago in Gleglui in Verlozi Park um, with a few students from the Tongji University. Prof, you have walked quite a journey with Peace Box Foundation. Can you give us a little bit of background on, on your relationship with the foundation? Well, as you said, it's been a, quite a long journey. Um, sometime after 1997, I met uh, Dr. Anton uh, Rupert when he came to London for a visit uh, shortly after the uh, EPF had been launched. And I met him through a mutual friend uh, of ours called Monte Shadow. Uh, Dr. Rupert knew a little bit about my work, I think, which I'd done for uh, WWF and uh, BirdLife Association, which I'll tell you about. But um, I was there to give him my views about the symbol that uh, had been created in South Africa, which he brought with him. And he wanted to have my views on whether it would work or needed to be redesigned. And I said I thought it would work extremely well and there was no need to create anything new or redesign it. So uh, WWF uh, at the, that time uh, concentrated on animal conservation and uh, I had a chance to redesign the symbol to make it uh, more realistic like a panda instead of a sort of doll-like appearance it had. But perhaps more importantly, I also helped them change their strategy from <clears throat> um, to nature conservation and to animal conservation, which of course go hand in hand. And I had the same opportunity to do this for BirdLife Association and creating a symbol for them and changing their positioning strategy. It was clear from the beginning, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Rupert described the vision of uh, PPF, that it, it included both ingredients because, uh, of course, it was a question of protecting the parks and bringing them all together. So the protection of wildlife was from the instigation, I think, for PPF, both nature and, and animal conservation. So uh, I decided uh, uh, at that time also that uh, I should uh, make my own personal donation. And uh, in this way, I became a member of an illustrious uh, group of initial donors to the foundation. So that was the beginning of my journey. And of course, I then followed uh, PPF uh, over the years, uh, their activities and participated in the way I could have. So that's where it all started a long time ago, uh, just at the beginning of PPF. So your, your work is taking you to Southeast Asia. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, I, uh, I've pioneered courses in brand strategies and design management uh, in Tongji University since uh, 2010, when I went out there and the creation of uh, the College of Design and Innovation. And uh, on a visit uh, to, uh, to PPF in Cape Town uh, with uh, Werner Mayberg, I suggested that my students uh, could perhaps uh, bring some new ideas to conservation and stop the terrible traffic going into China. And uh, he was not surprisingly very skeptic about this approach at that time. But, um, and the idea of investing in it, of course. But a year later, I uh, met with Brad Pohl and I decided that uh, I should make another donation uh, which could then be used to, as, an as an initial investment with uh, students to do some work. And uh, I think uh, that uh, 
worked out well and Werner was pleased about it. So we actually signed a contract to start working on um, different ideas, uh, which uh, was then signed by the dean uh, of the college. And uh, it began a journey of five years uh, of work. And um, the work of the students in that time has been quite remarkable and I uh, can tell you about some of the projects as we go along. So that was really how it all began. So what was your, what was the concept? How did you, how did you envision design students having a positive impact on the protecting rhino or wildlife in general? Well, it, it uh, may seem a bit far-fetched, but uh, students are uh, very, very uh, open uh, to new ideas and challenges. And uh, the students in China are uh, very, very clever. And uh, they were uh, willing to tackle this as a completely new challenge outside of their normal range of uh, design um, ideas. So um, it was not uh, as complicated as uh, you might imagine, but it was a bit of a David and Goliath situation, I guess, me against 1.3 billion people with very embedded ideas about uh, not only rhino horns, but the whole trade. But it turned out that uh, our activities has had a major influence um, through the various ideas that they produced, which went on uh, online, on social networks, and through a whole series of exhibitions. So this work has been going on now for five years, and each year a new group of students um, have tackled it. The course was uh, structured uh, uh, by myself and one of my colleagues, uh, Mo Zhao, who also came to South Africa with one student group, the first one. Uh, and uh, it was a uh, tough challenge because it was struggled. It was uh, structured as a, a workshop of eight weeks. So all they had uh, was eight weeks to find out what the scenario was, what the problems were, to come up with some ideas and then to put them into practice. Let's talk about the environment these students grew up in. Um, apart from the differences in attitudes towards um, the use of wildlife products, they, their homes and um, neighborhoods are, it's very different to the African environment. It was it difficult for them to tackle a design that um, that on a topic that's maybe not so familiar to them? That, that's a good question. But uh, I gave them uh, an, uh, something to think about by saying to them that uh, probably the most revered animal in China is the panda. And it is extremely well protected and it's known around the world. So I said, what would you think of their, them being captured, having their noses cut off, and used for medical purposes. And of course that comparison uh, made them think about it totally different. I have to say though that the young people, uh, they uh, did not really follow um, the practices of buying some of these products. It's mostly an older generation. And uh, these are uh, um, ideas from a long time back. Uh, the history of the rhino in China goes back uh, uh, over a hundred years when the last rhinos were killed by the emperors. And uh, it was not initially uh, um, an animal that was uh, used for anything except some of their horns were used for carvings and to put on uh, the shaft of knives and so on. So it had a different uh, impact. So the young people are not really into it. And uh, of course, for some years, uh, it has been officially banned in China, both uh, the purchase of ivory and uh, any other uh, 
bones from from uh, Africa and of course more recently also pangolins trade which has been terrifying so there is a condition for them to uh, welcome this and to be interested in it because they also were against it once we started the conversation and understood it was wrong but the, the main uh, challenge was to actually get the information out. You know, how do you how do you inform people about the practice and that it is wrong and that, of course, uh, the use of, of uh, rhino horn powder has long been proven to be completely wrong and there is no medical uh, benefit uh, from it which uh, people have believed for a long time. So uh, they were on board to uh, tackle this first step there for the briefing of all was to uh, create an information package uh, to make people understand that this was wrong and secondly to uh, create some ideas that would engage people uh, long term because you can talk people uh, into seeing something being wrong but if they're not engaged long term they soon forget about it so uh, the projects, many projects that they produced um, had these two ingredients to be interesting, informative about it and to get um, people engaged. So uh, that went from uh, games uh, to objects that were produced. So the climate for it, if you like, was there. Uh, and. Uh, they, in turn, uh, with their activities, could then eventually also talk to their parents and older people about uh, their views about it and influence them in this way. How were the projects received? Well, they have uh, had uh, a major impact, fortunately. So now, after the four or five years' activities, the result is that the two biggest uh, retail groups in China and in the world, Alibaba and, uh, and Tencent and many others, have banned all purchase and sales of uh, any uh, aspects of horns. So this is a, a very substantial influence. And other people have, uh, on internet, have become aware of it, of course. Uh, can now take a different view on it. It's uh, difficult to uh, provide any statistics at this stage about the impact because uh, students have done quite a bit of research because when they produce a project, part of their role is to see if it will have any effect. So they interview people and they get feedback on uh, the effect of it. The scenario is, is uh, I think, extremely positive and uh, I think uh, there is probably also some evidence uh, that the trade has uh, reduced. Sadly, of course, there are very few rhinos left, so there is not much um, that can be provided. Uh, but it is, it is a factor that people are now really understand that this is completely wrong. It should never have started. I love the I love the fact that um, you know the, the the fight against rhino poaching and wildlife crime um, is multifaceted. So there's you know the boots on the ground, um, the the people in the park, um, on sort of on the front lines of it, and then you know there are various levels, and and it's not it's not a simple problem to solve. It's something that requires collaboration and innovation and in your case creativity um, which is almost not something that you would directly link to something like combating wildlife crime um, the, the fact that creativity is used to change cultural perspectives I, I find that absolutely fascinating it is it is and and it was uh, also a bit of an experiment because it was not in the normal curriculum of the students but uh, be, through a, a multidisciplinary approach uh, using various uh, skills of students uh, it was uh, not difficult to develop this into a, 
a very thoughtful uh, process of thinking about alternatives to change the culture in a country which is deeply embedded uh, and to use various tools and methods to uh, raise awareness and to make people participate in conservation uh, activities. So um, maybe by describing one or two uh, projects, uh, one of the first ones which was extremely successful was, was the creation of a face mask uh, designed by industrial students. This um, face mask had some uh, additional uh, qualities. Of course, face masks are worn a lot in China, uh, have been for a long time because of pollution and other reasons. And this face mask had a, had a small plastic uh, nose on at the end of it indicating a uh, the horn and then there was a story uh, attached to it and um, cycling is very popular in China so students organized uh, big events with cyclists where these uh, face marks were given out to the cyclist and of course the metaphor for this was that you need to protect your face and uh, and you also need to protect the face of rhinos. And this has been a huge success and um, is still uh, being used in, for many events. So that's a typical case where you could link a, a product, a human product, to something quite uh, sophisticated, uh, how to protect animals. Another one was the creation of a little Rhino. I think you may have seen a couple of these and have them in the office. And this uh, rhino uh, has a horn attached, which you could take off, and has been produced in many, many different types of uh, materials. And of course, it's very popular among children, and it becomes like a mascot. And uh, there are many different versions that have been produced and are continued to be produced now in different materials. One idea with it, which uh, uh, also has worked very well, was that it was embedded in, uh, in soap. So that you wash your hands, and after uh, the soap starts to integrate, you get this rhino uh, in your hand. So this is another uh, object which, uh, of course, then is a long-term engagement. It, it stays in the hand of the people who get it, and it's been used in many um, exhibitions because one of the things about uh, Tongji, they have exhibitions of their work uh, which also travels around in the country. So all these objects are in display, and. Uh, Talks are being given about it and the benefits of it. Another one was a, a production of, of a, a whole series of little bookmarks that look like this. Uh, and the idea was that uh, they would go to all the uh, uh, bookshops around the country and be given out free in, uh, uh, in a book. It folds into a little rhino. And then inside is the story of rhino protection. So there are different angles to reach different publics to expose them to uh, the situation and to get them engaged uh, in it. One uh, other successful project was uh, uh, a historical review of the rhino in China. Uh, which was destined for museums to explain the background of uh, the rhino in China and what had happened to it uh, since. So uh, the students came up with many different approaches to reach different publics. One of the most uh, powerful tools, of course, in China are social networks. Uh, and there are uh, 20 social networks um, in China with more than a billion users daily. So uh, if you can get any of these ideas into a, a social network, it's fantastic because the impact is, is monumental. So that was a, a, a kind of a, a, a quick 
expose of some of the work that's that's been going on and that is uh, still carrying on today one of the uh, one of the results uh, which was acknowledged also by the school was then the creation of a, uh, a separate lab called the she lab and, and the word she uh, stands for rhino and also for protection uh, so it's a separate lab in college which works on uh, nature and uh, animal conservation so the new projects that uh, the students tackle now go in uh, collaboration with this lab and it's now stretches further to also look at uh, protection for pangolins and, and other animals that are threatened uh, in in africa it's been fascinating to see it has how it has evolved into a a different kind of thinking and different challenge for students to use design and design ideas to uh, inform people and to get them engaged. So a big um, sort of a second part was that there was a little bit of a competition between the students, um, between the different teams, and then the base team uh, would be selected to travel to South Africa and visit one of our conservation areas. Um, and I think that's where you and I met. Um, can you can you explain or, or just share some of the experiences that you had with the students when visiting South Africa? Well, uh, as you said, we we had uh, usually around forty students, and they were put into teams of five people, and they were competing against each other for the best solution uh, of that particular year. And the winning group was then invited to come to South Africa. So we had, before COVID uh, happened, there were two groups who went down to South Africa. And uh, the first one, uh, Professor Mo Jiao came with them. Uh, and I think you might have met her. And in the second group, I came down also with a professor from Tsinghua University, very big one in Shanghai. And one of the professors there, uh, Sai Jun, he also conducted uh, um, uh, some very, very uh, successful projects with his students. So uh, it was wonderful to be able to bring them, of course, to uh, see the reality of life. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, they have had very little experience in uh, in China. They have maybe seen some wildlife in some zoos but there are not too many, and perhaps documentaries. So to, to be put in a major park uh, among all these wonderful animals uh, and be close up and see many rhinos, which they did, all of them, was, uh, was an incredible experience. Really amazing because I've never seen so much, so many animals in such a short time. I think uh, probably the the most powerful event, which is when I was there, one group was taken by helicopter to uh, to see a rhino that had just been found being uh, being shot and uh, had the horns cut off, and they were, I mean, they were in tears when they came back. The emotional impact uh, uh, is incredibly powerful. And of course, they have all become ambassadors for life and for nature, the conservation now. So um, to give students a chance to come to see wildlife is unparalleled. And uh, I think we also uh, there had a chance for the students to present what they're thinking of doing to some of the to some of the staff in the parks it was quite a big group gathering and I think it was fascinating for them to see how quickly students had grasped uh, the problem and how they had found ways of communicating uh, the disasters of uh, poaching. One of the things that were very that was very memorable for me was when we um, spoke to the students um, and and the one the one student said that he looked up at the sky and he couldn't believe the stars. 
I don't know, there's a lot of emotions just going on and I feel the peace and the, the, the rarely I feel peace in, in some environment and in, in South Africa I feel it. And when you look at the sky at night, it's just beautiful, just beautiful. No, I, I, my whole life I've spent in Africa. So looking at the stars for me is sort of, you know, that's run of the mill. You, I walk outside, I look up and I can see the stars. And sometimes, you know, we go to more remote places and you see the whole Milky Way and, you, you know, you get inspired by that. Um, but these students are, I, I mean, at the age of early 20s, late teens, for them to see stars for the first time, I mean, that was... It was such a uh, such a an inspirational thing to see, and it also um, opened my mind a little bit to how big the disconnect can be between children growing up in big cities where they've never seen the stars, um, and and a conservation area, a natural area um, with wildlife. You know, it, it, there's a very big disconnect between the two. Oh, oh yes, it, it's shocking, really. I mean, as you know, China has uh, ten cities with more than twenty million people, and the people who live in these big conurbations, uh, the cities are quite badly polluted most of the time. Uh, so to see the, a clear sky is is a rare thing. You have to travel out of the cities to the countryside to experience this, and. Uh, uh, many children never get this um, opportunity. <coughs> uh, but China is a big country, and some of the nature in China is fantastic. And there are big, big parks uh, where the uh, pandas are protected, and there are other animals that are also under protection in nature parks. So they do exist, and, uh, and children can be connected with this at some point in their life. But uh, the real uh, total nature experience which you have in a park in, in Africa is mind-boggling by comparison. And uh, to be surrounded by wild animals and to look up in the sky at night is, uh, is of course, uh, an, an immense experience. So that will stay with them for life as well, so they know that it exists. And uh, they can perhaps in the future also help make sure that uh, both nature and uh, animals can be better protected and uh, the future is there to develop still. Prof, it has been so lovely speaking to you today. Um, I look forward to following your journey with the students. Thank you. I, I uh, do um, stay in touch with them and I do I'm able to do some lectures uh, online, but of course it's uh, not as frequent and it's by distance. So there are some other activities that I can be involved with. Uh, I was in Dubai this year, uh, participated in a very fascinating program presented in the Swedish Pavilion at the World Expo which was under the title of Space for Nature. I had a week there to present our work in China and the work of PPF. One of your colleagues uh, came to join me there. To let children have workshops to play with some of the games we put together for um, nature conservation. So there are other channels uh, which are open for me to work on and uh, Whenever I have the opportunity to do it, I, I grab it and my uh, conviction uh, and participation of all the good work that is done by PPF is total and I hope to continue to support it in any way I can, as long as I can. Thank you so much for your incredible support and I think you have touched so many lives um, in your in your journey and and you've made a, a significant contribution to conservation and wildlife protection so thank you so much for that